Welcome to the Biotech Startups Podcast by Exceda. Join us as we speak with first-time founders, experienced scientists, serial entrepreneurs, and biotech investors about the challenges and triumphs of running a biotech startup. Gain actionable insight into navigating the life sciences industry in each episode as we explore the business of science from pre-seed to IPO with your host, John Chi. The purpose of the Biotech Startups podcast is to provide general insight into the ever-changing world of life sciences through the experience of a variety of guests. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from this podcast are at the user's own risk. The views expressed by guests and any employee of Exceda on the podcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Exceda or content sponsors. Any appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement or recommendation of any product, service or entity referenced in the podcast by Exceda or by its guests. My third guest is James Evans, founder and CEO of PhenoVista Biosciences, a contract research organization that works with biopharma clients of all sizes, from startups to established global companies. PhenoVista develops and implements high content imaging based phenotypic cellular assays for lead optimization, mechanism of action studies, and target validation for preclinical models. Before starting PhenoVista, James spent a decade at MIT's Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research as a postdoc a research scientist, and finally, director of the Bioimaging Center. After MIT, James went on to serve as a director at numerous venture-backed biotechs before founding Fina Vista to offer his expertise to clients around the world. Over the next three episodes, we cover a wide range of topics, from his late-blooming love of science, his time at Harvard and MIT, his move to San Diego, and his bootstrapped entrepreneurial journey with Fina Vista. Today, we'll chat about the early years, how skateboarding and video games honed his problem-solving skills, the Belgian lab that sparked his drive for science, and his experience joining MIT's Whitehead Institute. Without further ado, let's dive into episode three of the Biotech Startups podcast. What was your childhood like, and how did you get into science and entrepreneurship? Well, this is, this is like I said, I was listening to your, your previous guests, and I'm like, and, uh, you know, I, there was a big mistake because these guys are like, yeah. so I started off, and I like, you know, did all this science stuff when I was like eight and cured cancer at 12 and you know, did that. And I'm like, wow, I, I didn't really get it. I guess I'm a late starter is what I would call myself. I like, you know, my, my childhood and I spent a lot of time skateboarding and, and, and playing video games and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. I really was an underachiever and, uh, I, you know, I was bright enough, I guess, but like um, I was always told I could, could try harder and I really didn't sort of, apply myself until you know until last year of my undergrad like I really the light didn't really go off for me until uh yeah until I I until I um yeah spent a year abroad working in a lab in uh, in Belgium and um yeah so I mean my my you know my dad is an engineer and uh, my mom is a nurse so that's kind of you know putting kind of the so back back fitting the uh the data you're like oh okay well i kind of do sort of you know life sciences and quantum so that's kind of engineering and you know you can kind of see the the two hemispheres there but um yeah yeah uh, yeah it wasn't it wasn't uh i was in no way a bookworm or or like you know a, a real sort of like science nerd growing up um yeah kind of a non-traditional I, approach <laughs> yeah and i honestly is is for me personally i was also a skateboarder and i I also yeah. played a lot of video games as well. So yeah. sometimes I I feel like I, you know, I didn't, you know, I got a, a late start as well. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I thought I was going to be a lawyer at one point in time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and skating and, and, you know, playing video games. I, I don't have as much, to, well, skateboarding, one thing I probably would get very much injured nowadays, Yeah. but for video games, you know, I, I, my wife and I play video games, you know, on, on our free time too. So I, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, have a similar, a similar kind of, uh, upbringing. Um, but, you know, I, I thought it was really, you know, interesting that, you know, you, you mentioned that your parents were, were both scientists. Um, but, you know, perhaps only when you look kind of retrospectively, it was kind of mm-hmm. what brought you to it. Um, yeah. But, you know, when you were growing up, was science always a presence in the household or did you, did, was it a, a thing where you like rebelled against it? I, I my dad's an engineer, oh. so I know I kind of did. Yeah. But. 
Yeah, no, not at all. Like I, in science, I don't remember it being present at all. Like compared, you know, I have young kids now and we have, you know, these like things that come in the mail every couple of weeks, these little science kits and stuff. And, you know, my son and I do you know, stuff that, you know, build hydraulics and, and really cool stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't do any of that growing up. I, 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 I sadly don't remember really that much. I think a lot of my, a lot of my childhood was just spent sort of being, being I was super energetic like just running in circles and just being like my pet my mom just laughs at me now when she sees my kids doing the same and she's like yeah that's how you were just like full of energy and and, and I think going back to like you know skateboarding and and uh video games I mean you know one one of, one of the things that I did sort of did resonate with me and listening to Jake and Steve and their podcast was sort of you know problem solving and and sort of um um you know resilience to to adversity and things like that and yeah i mean video video games video games teach you how to solve problems you know it's all like puzzles really and 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 in a, in a way you know skateboarding is like that too you know you have to learn a lot of technical aspects to to control your body and also interact with the environment and stuff when you break it down you know it, there's there are a lot of kind of transferable skills to entrepreneurship i think that, that maybe get overlooked Absolutely. And like, I, is it really getting me fired up? Because I, I spent a lot of time growing up skateboarding and like mm -hmm. the, that problem solving, like I still remember trying to figure out how to land my first kickflip. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you, you kind of have to break it down. Like, all right, pop, pop the tail, mm -hmm. but you need mm -hmm. to sequentially do the flick and yeah. everything like that. And like really like chunking it out. Was yeah. Got to get your back leg up. Go yeah, get your back leg higher than you think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The thing. It, People don't think about that. Yeah. Exactly. And I also, and again, this is like personally, but I think there was a certain amount of perseverance that skateboarding, <laughs> like, yeah. you got to be ready. You're not running, you know, you're running through proverbial walls. You're like mm -hmm. to try and do the trick, but you're just failing right. and failing. Um, so yeah. I, I completely, you know, think the same thing um about skateboarding and yeah and there's the you know the kind of the uh, going against the grain and the kind of rebellious aspect of skateboarding and um yeah at least at least when i when i was doing it it was it was in the uk you know got kind of very not mainstream and um you know everybody's playing soccer in the uk and like skateboarding was kind of very sort of counterculture and i think it is in the u.s still but uh but yeah i mean that, that you need you need that little bit of kind of because it's hard to start a company and you know decide decide you're going to do that and uh, I think you know so yeah so those things all sort of contribute sort of aside from the sort of the science aspect of things the sort of the personality aspect I think is uh you know interesting an interesting part of the puzzle absolutely um and so as you were growing up and you know you're going through middle school and high school mm -hmm. was there mm -hmm. any sort of inkling of science at that point in time or was it something that kind of spurred like when you when you got to your undergrad yeah I, I was I was thinking back prior to this and um you know I had a really good um high school biology teacher Mrs. Akhtar and uh, this is in in uh, I'm from Birmingham in England and um yeah she was she was really good she really inspired and I really I remember like you know learning about different aspects of biology and plant biology and just finding it um uh, you know you like tractable like you could learn things and it was and it wasn't like you just had to sort of memorize it but it was it was it was so varied and I think that's what I that's carried forward to like right now like you know dealing with our clients and so on like you know um learning about their their biology and the diseases they're they're trying to treat and and you just are constantly surprised by like all the, the sort of the depth and breadth of, of of biology and how it works and you know for me you know my 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 A levels, which in the UK are the the the, the subjects that you specialize in prior to going to going to um uh, to university, and you know I had a really eclectic mix of biology, English literature, and economics, and um you know English literature was good because it allowed me to like write, like I was pretty decent at writing, but I, I always looked at that and was like, well, what job am I going to do with a degree in English? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you'll be a teacher basically is like the kind of the, the only kind of avenue. And then your know, economics, I just really struggled with whether my teacher wasn't the best or whatever. I just like whenever I would learn something in economics, it would just be sort of like uh the rules never seem to apply or, or hold true. And I'd be like, 
this just seems like bullshit to me. I can't, <laughs> I can't like, I can't learn this stuff. And, and so I, that really didn't stick with me. So that, that left me with biology. And, and so I, I, I sort of forged ahead with that. And uh, I think, you know, then I got into this um, undergraduate program, which was somewhat unique um, where they had a, um, it was a four year degree in the third year you spent working in the lab and, and, so we had this uh, Erasmus program. It was a, a, a sort of European Union uh, program that um, allowed you to travel to a lab on, on, in the European mainland. And so I went to a lab in in Belgium, and um, that was that was transformational for me because I, I kind of really, at that point, started working alongside all these people, uh, grad students and postdocs, and they were all you know multilingual, you know, speaking French, Italian, English. And you know, collaborating with labs in California, and it really kind of lit a fire in me. Is to sort of seeing the application of the sort of the the stuff we were learning back in college and stuff. And so when I when I came back from from Liège, uh, I, I really applied myself in in sort of the undergraduate studies. And so that was a real turning point for me. But uh, I always I would, my my one defining uh, memory of of the lab in Belgium was resuspending bacterial pellets so there were these like big you know vats they were like a uh like like you know five inch across big vats of, of bacterial cultures and you'd spin them down and you'd have these like you know like big chewing gum like pellet of bacteria in the bottom and this is back in the day we were doing mouth pipetting which shows how old i am but we we're like had these like 25 mil mouth pipettes and we we're like pipetting it up and down to resuspend this this like <laughs> chewing gum clump, and mm. and and I'm doing it, and like you know, after a while, you know, the, eventually a clump would get stuck in the pipette, and you'd be sucking on it, and then it would let go. It flew into my mouth, and I'm like, oh my god! And I'm like, I'm like, oh, and I'm looking over at the the grad student next to me, and you know, I'm saying, oh, it went in my mouth, and expecting him to like, you know bust into some kind of medical scenario you know, like okay we're gonna you know something's we're gonna, we're gonna take care of this and like call the medic and <laughs> all this kind of stuff and he just he just looked at me and he was like this really suave you know french speaking guy and he's like yeah tastes like corn doesn't it and i'm like <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> just, just get back to work and it was just like hilarious but uh, oh yeah. my goodness <laughs> so kind he's like yeah been there <laughs> yeah yeah, been there. yeah. <laughs> welcome um, to the lab yeah that reminds me, um, I, I was actually chatting with a family friend and um, when he, he was mentioning how when he was uh, at a lab at Berkeley, also had back when mouth pipetting was like totally the the kind of status quo and they would just yeah. be like mouth pipetting like DMSO and just yeah. like casually just like, yeah, this is yeah. not problematic at all. No, it's all right. A little thidium bromide and all yeah. that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah this is yeah. this is totally okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, this program sounds incredible. Like, was it, how, how did you find this program and how, like- Oh yeah, it was good. I mean, the, the university that I went to, Coventry University was really, really kind of a, a little bit ahead of its time because it did a lot more kind of, um, like there's, there's a lot of like hierarchy in, in university, I guess like there is in the US, right? So this was definitely not like, you know, the, the you know top tier university compared with like, you know, Cambridge and Oxford, but it was a very sort of like, functional university in that it, it had a lot of good relationships with industry and it had it's, it was most it is most sort of famous for its um uh, relationships with the automotive industry there's a lot of like car designers that go on to work for like you know range rover and you know all the sort of british british marks and stuff so um but it had a really good um sort of applied biology program and um they were also um sort of well connected with these um, European initiatives to 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 sponsor um, you know young people to get to get um, research exposure and I mean it made a huge difference to me um, yeah we had people I mean there were there were I think there were about fifty of us that all went to different um, places around Europe and uh, there were two or three of us that went to Belgium and it was Belgium was great I've I've never been back it's been twenty years plus now and uh, but uh, I keep thinking I'm gonna go back and uh, the the food the the waffles and the chocolate and stuff were really great. It was a, it was a great, and it, it, you know the other funny, the funny thing there is too was like every Friday in the lab they would have um, they would have beer and cheese tasting laid awesome. out in the com in the conference room, and uh, this is like my first exposure to like working in a professional sort of lab, and yeah. so you know I'll get used to that. And then I remember uh, 
you know, going to like, uh, I think it must have been grad school lab and I'd be like, and it'd be like Friday afternoon and I'd be like, where's your beer and cheese? Mm. And they're, like, they're, like, <laughs> they're like, oh, that's, that's a Belgium thing, not a lab yeah. thing. I was like, man, it's too bad because yeah. that was a good, that was a good perk. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that, yeah, that's amazing. Like for us, it was just like, yeah, we got some, um, got some pizza like from, oh, from yeah. time to time. <laughs> I was, no, I was, these guys I would have like beer. all the, yeah, these guys would have all the, uh, you know, different flavored Belgian beers and stuff like cherry and all the different, like, yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, during your time in that program, was there any specific like moment where like the, you knew the fuse was just like lit where you're like this, this is exactly what I want to be doing or were there perhaps yeah. a mentor or someone who took you under their wing? Yeah, not, not a huge mentorship though. I mean, I did work with, with a couple of grad students who were, you know, I mean, I was so, you know, green that I was, it was, I mean, they were, they were friendly and supportive, but I think it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until I got to grad school. So I, I when I got, when I grad, I came back and, 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 you know, worked really hard in my last year in my undergrad and, and kind of turned around my grades and everything. And, and that got me to a point where I could, you know, I was thinking about, you know, what, what should I do as far, as far as next steps? And I wasn't really sure as to sort of what um, job I wanted or, you know, a lot of people just get a degree and then don't, don't sort of continue in biology. They just use it as a sort of a generic degree. And, um, you know, I, I, I started thinking about, you know, grad school, having, having been, you know, working alongside people doing PhDs and, or uh, in, in Belgium and applied to some programs. And I got an interview, um, at, uh, the, uh, medical research council up in Edinburgh. And, um, I, I really honestly didn't know what I was signing up for when I applied. I just sort of thought, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's much like starting a business. You don't. You don't know if you knew you might not do it, but you're just yeah. like well, other people. People have other people have done it, so you know I should be able to do it. Yep. Um. And and uh, I went up and had an interview, and uh, you know the head of the lab, uh, Alan Professor Alan McNeely, who's a really um, accomplished uh, uh, scientist and um, in, in endocrinology. Yeah, he was just really down to earth, and you know had all these like massive tomes up on the wall with people's names and dates on them, and. I remember looking over his shoulder and just seeing them and, and realized they're putting sort of two and two together and going, Oh, you have to write one of those. I'm like, Oh, I was like, you know, okay, I guess, well, these people did it. I can do it, you know, yeah. um, but you know, and Alan was really the first, um, you know, kind of person who was, you know, quote unquote accomplished who, you know, who just, you know, and he's, you know, like a senior guy and he, and he just, he would say to me, you know, I remember him saying, yeah, I'm not any smarter than you. Of course he is, but he's just, just that. And he, and he would say like, you know, I'm not any smarter than you. I'm just older. And, you know, I, the things I'm telling you, you know, I, I've learned through trial and error and just made more mistakes. And that really resonated. And that's really stuck with me. Uh, I've, I've said that to people working in my lab or people I've worked with. It's just, you know, when you're like in your early 20s and you're working with somebody in their late 30s, they, they've got like nearly 20 years head start on you in terms of, stuff they've messed up in the lab that they just pass along to you and um but i thought it was really it, that really stuck with me as kind of a way to sort of um you know kind of nurture that you know not, not because i think it would be really intimidating i think even more so these these days it's just you know people are so accomplished and it's so like in your face you know about like how well how well everyone's doing and it can be it can you know can turn off people i think yeah I, that really resonates with me because I think sometimes, especially in the, like the age of the internet, um, the what's presented almost feels like, you know, people just stick the landing, like they do the yeah the triple yeah. backflip, stick the landing, and first time, you know, first, first time, time, no problem, yeah, yeah. no problem, they land the kickflip <laughs> first try, you know, yeah. instead of having to like you know yeah. hyper analyze it, and mm -hmm. that really, you know, it I I, I can think about so many times in in my lab experience and even just with exceder of uh, it was just like it was just raw trial and error um until mm -hmm. like it was almost like a forcing function of just trying to see what yeah. works um but it doesn't sound i guess it doesn't sound elegant <laughs> like really mm -hmm. but yeah. it's it's kind of just the you know i i think it's there's an i guess there's an elegance to the simplicity of it um yeah which i completely you know agree with 
Um, yeah. And as you were in, in, in Alan's lab, was that, was the focus of his lab kind of what carried through your grad program and up to kind of like, you know, when you started to think about making the move, you're in the United, United States now, um, like that you wanted to continue that, you know, in your, in your journey? Yeah, so so it was, it was I was kind of a an, an outlier um, with it within Paul within sorry Alan's lab. He um you know his his lab was an endocrinology lab. They're looking at uh, uh, LH and FSH hormone um, secretion as, as part of the estrous cycle, and and so they used a lot of in vivo models, sheep and and rats and mice and things like that. And um, when I came into lab, I worked alongside. Um, uh, some somebody uh, uh, a sort of a senior scientist in his lab, uh, Pam Brown, who was really instrumental in uh, teaching me, you know, giving me the fundamentals in what this is in the late '90s, where we're relatively cutting edge techniques of molecular biology and plasma cloning and GFP fusion protein construction and linker proteins and, and and all that kind of thing. So so our job, Pam and I, was to sort of get some in vitro assays together to complement these in vivo approaches and that that's actually very similar to what we do at Fina Vista um, right now um, and so I I started off you know that's where I learned about well sort of GFP and imaging but also critically learned about subpopulation effects so like if you're transfecting one of these endocrinology so endocrine cell cell types that are really hard to transfect especially back in the day using the tools we had then, you, know, you might get one or 2% transfection efficiency. And so if you're expressing a mutant in those cell types, but the 98% of the cells are unperturbed, I'm just doing, you know, you're not yeah. going to be able to measure anything like yeah. in, a, in, a, in a bulk yeah. measurement when you're doing a radio immuno assay or something like you yeah. just doesn't make a dent in it. Yeah. So, so what happened was we ended up getting, we, you know, the, 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 um, the unit there, reproductive biology unit, they, they got one of these, uh, they got a really nice Zeiss confocal, a Zeiss LSM 510. And, um, and we started doing imaging and looking at those individual cells or, or clusters of cells that are expressing the, the fusion protein. And that, yeah, that was just hugely transform, transformational for me. I mean, I really got into you know, the power of, of, of doing imaging and it was really cutting edge stuff. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that was, that was a, a jumping off point from there. I applied to uh, some postdocs in the U S and um, yeah. And, and, and so that it was for me. So, you know, I, I grew up in, in Saudi Arabia, actually um, my dad, my dad worked um, there and, and uh, my, my two brothers were born there and, um, so I, I, I grew up in a kind of an American um, culture because it was a kind of an expat culture of, of, of expat, um, um, you know, American engineers. So for me, it wasn't as daunting to, to move to the States because I kind of felt like I had some sort of cultural sort of um, uh, understanding of, of the differences. And it just didn't, I, the distance didn't seem like a big deal. I used to travel back and forth from England to, to Saudi Arabia as a, as a small kid. And, and stuff. So um, I applied to to some grad processes so and postdoc programs in uh, in the U.S. and uh, you know came over for that in 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 '99. And uh, I ended up um, at uh, a lab that was affiliated with uh, Harvard Medical School at the time, which I, I wish I was like super blown away by that opportunity. I was like, wow, made it! This is like crazy. I'm like going to Harvard. And 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 it, and it was a it was a really eye opening experience. Um, but but what I found out very quickly was that at the time, and this is in the late nineties, um, the medical school there didn't really hadn't really invested in imaging um, tools the way that other places had. And and I, I was coming from you know the lab that I had where we had this LSM five ten. You know they did they had a biorad system which at the time was like not as good. And I found it really frustrating um, to the point where I looked around um, online to see who had an LSM 510 in Boston and, and found that the Whitehead Institute had just bought one. And, um, and so I, I kind of reached out to the, to the head of the, of the facility there as Paul Matsudera and said, Hey, you know, can I, can, is your, is your LSM 510 available for outside users? And he's like, yeah, it is get in contact with the core manager and so on. And a few minutes went by and I was like, 
I just sent him another email and said, Hey, by the way, I'm really not happy with my, with my lab here. I was hoping I could come and chat to you about maybe switching labs. And, and it was just on a way. I just kind of like wrote it and then just hit send and then you know, cross my <laughs> yeah. fingers. And then, and then, you know, he got back to me and, and he agreed to meet with me and, you know, fast forward, I ended up working with Paul for like 10 plus years. And, and, you know, later on, he confided in me that like he, he took that meeting thinking I was somebody else. And he didn't really know who I was. And I ended up like coming in and meeting with him and, and just, you know, telling him about my like, you know, what I wanted to do and how passionate I was about imaging. And he and he just straight up took a chance on me. Wow. And uh and and you know, like I said, I ended up working uh at the Whitehead and at MIT for, for over ten years. And it was a that was a hugely, hugely I mean, like so Paul after after Alan, Paul was the next uh, huge mentor in my in sort of scientific career. Um, had a really amazing combination of of talents in his lab. Like a lot of, like I think at one point, really Paul and I were the only biologists in in the lab. Like everybody else had kind of a, a different background, whether it was computational or chemistry or you know biophysics or something like that. And so it was a real cross disciplinary um, environment. And then you know we, a couple of things went on. Um, you know, we we were doing like pretty high end at the time. You know, computational imaging using deconvolution and uh, you know big data sets and using like silicon graphics computers yeah. or, like data. Silicon. Yeah, it was like, but yeah, cool, but like really slow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. At the time, they're really expensive. But like you know, now you know, and and uh, but uh, there was a so it was a I. I I had a friend, uh, Sanjoy Ray. I still have a friend called Sanjoy Ray, but he uh, <laughs> he was in he was in uh, he was in Peter Kim's lab next door at the Whitehead, and um, yeah, they were a you know a really uh, high flying lab at the time, and uh, you know it was a really it was a really crazy sort of environment to be in, where like you know budgets were just not a problem. You like you know you just you, you'd spend ten twenty thousand dollars on you know some some dot block matrix and then it would sit in the fridge for six months because you yeah. didn't get around to it it was just like wow you know i remember asking yeah. somebody hey can i order this and they just looked at me like why are you wasting my time with that it's like ten thousand. just do it and you're oh, like, wow. oh God. yeah yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was different times like it changed like you know it changed like uh you know while i was there but when i first got there in the late 90s it was it was really uh spendy but uh but one of the things that that so Sanjoy was involved, he was he had a structural biology background, and he was he was um, you know managing the computational infrastructure for the for the Kim Lab, and then more largely for there was a lot of sort of synergy with with we we kind of so Paul and I were using a lot of the resources that the Kim Lab had as far as silicon graphics instruments and stuff, and then so what Sanjoy was looking over my shoulder one day. And was like seeing me struggle with these big imaging data sets. He was like, "Man, you you really need some more computational horsepower." And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> you know, sure." And and so then you know he went away and like started working on on getting us, you know, like a million dollar like you know mainframe computer type like one of these wow. big sixty four bit um, silicon graphics computers for um, you know for crunching crunching images, and it was. It was it was huge. Like it really kickstarted us into the computational aspects of imaging. And you know, by the time Sanjoy and I sort of finished working at the Whitehead, we had the second biggest server room at, at MIT. We had like a huge, like I mean, it was huge. It was like um, I don't know, it was like forty feet by twenty feet, you know, room server room with like oh you know God. big computers from like IBM and SGI and like they, you know terabytes and terabytes of storage and i mean it doesn't sound big anymore but you know it's but yeah, it was at yeah, the time yeah. and uh but uh yeah so it was um that and the you know around the turn of the century as so of early to 2000s was a big move in systems biology and and so there was a lot of within paul's lab there was a lot of collaboration with industry and technology platform providers so there was a very sort of um you know, it wasn't like we try to build everything in house. It was much more like collaborating with these other, um, uh, you know, microscope vendors or software companies or, or um, you know, uh, computer storage folks and all that. And um, and then you know, with the computational systems biology initiative at MIT, 
there was a real push to take a systems approach to biology and, and that was really um, eye-opening and, and sort of like using using imaging to collect a lot of data about cells and, and models was I mean that that's all we do now for you know Fina Vista. so like that was really good training and really good exposure to sort of that um, scalable automated um, quantitative approach awesome that honestly that sounds like a pretty badass <laughs> like oh yeah from from one meeting that that yeah. was like uh, by accident <laughs> unfolded oh, yeah. into a just super badass experience at least what i'm yeah. what, what i would imagine sounds amazing yeah. um yeah. because and it, it was funny when you were uh mentioning the the lsm and mm -hmm. and i just had a similar you know ha having going from like a, a lab that wasn't as well funded to a well-funded lab and mm -hmm. And just experiencing like the dichotomy and yeah and i honestly just like remember getting really tired like on berkeley's campus we were at the very very bottom of the hill and the core facilities are at the top of the hill uh, um, so we would i would have to run samples up every day to get up to the core facility and yeah, i was yeah. just like oh man i am so tired can we just please just like get can we get the flow cytometer into our lab yeah. I like I can't yeah. do this anymore um yeah. but yeah the you know while while at MIT it sounds like you had you know you spent a, a, pr a fairly long time there you know you said I think yeah, you said 10 like years a decade, yeah. 10 years yeah. Yeah. and and you were you know I, I don't think it's a you know I, I think it's a more or, you know not a common experience to kind of have core facility experience mm. what was it like when you know you, you're you're doing you're using a lot of equipment you know and I'm sure you're probably managing other labs who are like hey we need to use the equipment too what was just yeah. like the experience operationally you know obviously with the handling all the data handling all the equipment mm -hmm. and you know for whether it be MIT or Harvard or any of the labs and yeah. industry partners yeah it, it was there was a little bit of like kind of branding in terms of there was a core facility at the Whitehead that did was a more traditional core facility and then so then Paul set up this Whitehead MIT Bioimaging Center, which was, um, it, it, we definitely had, um, you know, access, you know, we, we opened it up to people, but it was more of a, like a kind of a collaborative rather than a sort of fee-for-service type approach. Yeah. So so there was, there were aspects of, of, of my job supporting Paul as, as, the, as the head of this, it, it, which, which involved, um, you know, budgets and, and, and you know, um, data, um data backups and um you know performance of, of of the equipment all that kind of thing um but uh but yeah we we you know it, it was it was pretty it was a pretty cool environment because i got i got kind of tasked with supporting a lot of grad students and and postdocs from yeah mostly mostly at mit but but sometimes you know from the community from the larger community who would, who would come to me with, you know, like a problem of like, hey, I want to measure this, you know, effect, this translocation effect in, in uh, you know, particular cell type over a period of hours. And, you know, the, I, I think I should use, you know, time resolved fret in, you know, in 3D. And I'm like, yeah, you could, but, <laughs> you know, when do you want to graduate? You know, it's like, yeah. you know, what, what data do you need? You, you could just do a lower resolution, more automated approach, get the numbers you need and get out of here. And they'll be like, yeah, I'll do that one. So, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like taking like a common sense approach to like, you know, what's the answer? What's what, what's the question that you're asking and what's the quickest way to to get to that? And and that, that again, is another kind of uh, um yeah, thing that's translated to my my day job now, or at least the folks that sort of interact more directly with their clients is, you know, sort of advising them on, you know, not doing the most sort of convoluted, fanciest approach, but sort of what's what's going to get you the data, the most reliable, uh, cost effective, time, you know, intensive or or time expedient uh, manner uh, as possible. Yeah, yeah that that's incredible because I mean that type of advice to a grad student or a postdoc is invaluable mm -hmm. and I feel like not everyone gets that advice and yeah. they do the fancy they they do the fancy you know all the bells and whistles but yeah. the time just expands and expands and expands and you know yeah. uh, I have colleagues who 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 you know who went the fancy route and then exactly what you kind of described and they're like 
God, I wish I did it the other way. Yeah, and yeah, shaved yeah. off some years um, off yeah. of this. Um, yeah. But that, I mean, that, that's incredible that you had the opportunity to do that. Yeah, we have. Well, we have really. Um, so Paul Matsvera went to um, went to grad school with um, Lance Taylor, who was uh, one of the originators of high content, or the originator of high content screening. Um, and uh, so back in like 2000, 2001, like these these high content screening instruments were really only in a few um, uh, big pharma companies, and they were. They were built for, for looking at like GPCR internalization and that's all. And they were really, um, they were like, they, they, they were sort of fit for purpose. And, but that, that was the only purpose. You, they yeah. weren't very flexible yeah. or user friendly at all. And so coming from a completely academic, you know, any tool is available and sort of complete freedom to that sort of constraint was incredibly frustrating. And, um, yeah you know it, it was it was really hard to make that transition but once we did and we figured out how to use that automated platform it became um really valuable it allowed us to um so I, I was doing all these like very sort of like swiss watchmaker type um 3d time lapse um imaging experiments which would take you know hours and hours to collect and you know they were very um uh low yield you know they wouldn't all they wouldn't all work and and so um you know, knowing like what the, which conditions were going to yield the most useful information was really important. So, you know, you, you kind of use this automated high content approach to map the sort of the topology of effects and say, okay, here at this particular dose and time uh, for this particular drug, you get a, in, an unusual uh, phenomenon or the cells are, you know, displaying a, a weird phenotype. So let's, let's do some higher resolution imaging and then see what's going on there. Um, so that's the way we used to sort of combine those two approaches. And that was, um, yeah, that was, that was relatively a novel approach. That's all for today's episode of the Biotech Startups podcast. We hope you enjoyed our insightful conversation with James Evans, covering his younger years, his initial foray into lab work, and his journey overseas to pursue his passion for imaging research. To learn more about James's journey, be sure to tune into next week's episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to having you join us again for part two of James's journey for an in-depth discussion on his time at MIT's Whitehead Institute, his path to entrepreneurship, and how different company cultures affect your work-life balance. The Biotech Startups Podcast is brought to you by Exceda. Don't want to miss an episode? Make sure to search for Biotech Startups Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and click subscribe. To learn more about our leasing program, visit our website www.excedr.com. We provide research labs with equipment leases on founder-friendly terms to support a path to exceptional outcomes. On behalf of the team here at Exceda, thanks for listening.